Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this week's Riot Science Club. Um, so while we're going to wait for a few more people to join, uh, we have a few announcements to make. So uh, first of all, earlier this week, we had a really, really um, cool workshop on reproducible data science with R that was organized by Reproducibility, the Francis Crick Institute and the Riot Science Club. So if you've missed it, you can still view the recordings and access all the materials on the Riot Science Club website, so do check that out. And you can also check the Riot's website to see all of the upcoming talks as well. And just as a reminder, do subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date with all the um, uh, videos we're uploading. So um, also wanted to um, bring this to your attention. So um, this is specifically for our listeners who are from King's College London. Uh, the library collections and research support team will be running some virtual workshops on research data management. Um, so they're going to have an intro one, then on data management during your research, and then data preservation and sharing. So do make sure to check those out on SkillsForge um, if you're interested. And then lastly, in terms of announcements, um, we do want to um, make sure that we're promoting dialogue and we're um, giving you all an opportunity to tell us how you're enjoying the Riot Science Club and whether there's anything that we could do to make it better. So we've created um, a questionnaire. Um, that's a very short feedback form that you can complete if you want to. Um, so we're going to put the uh, link in the Q&A uh, box so that you can follow it on there and it just takes around five minutes. So we would really, really be grateful if you could feed, um, fill this in at the end of the session uh, just to give us some feedback. And there's some space there to um, suggest future speakers and future workshop topics as well, uh, which would be really helpful for us in designing sort of the schedule for 2021. So um, without further ado, uh, for today's speaker, we have Dr. Courtney Soderberg um, giving us an introduction to the Open Science Framework. So Courtney is the statistician and data scientist at the Center for Open Science. Before working at the COS, she received her PhD in social psychology from the University of California, Davis. Um, so just a brief reminder, do ask any questions that you want to ask for Courtney in the Q&A box and do upvote any questions that you find interesting so we can address them at the end of her talk. So thank you, Courtney. Looking forward to your talk. All right, um, let me just share my slides. All right. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Courtney Soderberg. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about increasing openness and specifically how to do that using uh, the OSF. Um, so I work for Center for Open Science, which for those of you who don't know is a nonprofit um, in Charlottesville, Virginia, and the mission of COS is to increase the openness, reproducibility, and transparency of scholarly work. Um, and so I think when we think about sharing, a lot of times the first thing that comes to mind for people is data, maybe code underlying a publication. Um, and that is a great first step. If you have the data and the code, it allows you to do a computational reproducibility check. Um, but data um, isn't kind of the only thing that you might want to know if you're trying to reproduce either somebody else's work or your own work um, to build off of it. Um, so, I love the Great British Bake Off. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Great British Bake Off, um, during every episode, there is something called a technical challenge. Um, and what happens in the Great British Bake Off technical challenge is all of the bakers, and these are people who are, you know, they're trying to find the best amateur baker in Britain. So these are people who are like quite good bakers. Um, they are given a list of ingredients and they're given sort of something that they're supposed to be making. Um, this is, I think this is like a Swedish princess cake. Um, so they're given a list of ingredients, they have the ingredients, and then they're given very non-detailed um, instructions on how to do this. So it's kind of, you're told, you know, make a sponge, bake. You're not given a time, you're not given a temperature, you're not entirely told exactly how to do it. You're supposed to kind of rely on your baking intuition. Um, and as you might expect, uh, so what on the left is what they're supposed to make, and on the right is what people come up with. Um, so even though you're given a list of ingredients and amounts, because you're not given the actual specific steps to recreate the process of baking the cake, 
you get things that are like not that close. These are actually pretty close. Um, many of them turn out like disastrously. And so the point of this is that it's not just you need to know the ingredients. It's that you actually need more information about the process if you want to reproduce something. Um, so in science, we can think about this as really knowing the method. The method section of many papers I think of as the kind of the outline. Um, it has some detail, but it doesn't have nearly enough detail that you would need to actually reproduce um, the method that generated the data. Um, so as a good example of this, one of the replicability projects COS has been working on for a while is something called RPCB, the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology. Um, and so all these experiments have been reproduced now. And so the question is, you know, how many papers or experiments were we able to design a full methodological protocol based on the information just in the original published paper with no input from the original authors? Um, zero. Every single paper and experiment, there was some kind of key detail missing that you would need to try and reproduce that methodology. Um, and so the point here is that when we're thinking about sharing, there are different types of sharing we can think about. If you're thinking about sharing the outcomes, that may be open access, so preprints, postprints, eprints. The content may be open data, but the process may be about the workflow. So there's more than just data we want to think about sharing. So many of you may have heard of a data management plan. Um, data management plans aren't actually just about data, but I think when many people hear them, if they've never done one before, they think it's just about how am I going to be managing my data. Really, you want to be thinking about research management plans. How am I going to be managing all the files related to my research? The data, the code, uh, the protocols, the survey instruments, um, depending on the type of research you do. So I would encourage all of you to start thinking about coming up with a research management plan for yourself. And you want to be asking questions like, what am I going to store um, from my research? Where and how am I going to be storing it? I need to have access to that information. Is it just me? Is it me and my collaborators? Is it me, my collaborators, and eventually people I'm going to share this with? Um, and when are those different groups going to need to have access to it? It doesn't mean you need to come up with all of these answers like from the get-go, but those are sort of things you should start thinking about if you are thinking about sharing things down the road. Um, planning ahead is really key. Um, having checklists as reminders and common structures um, is really your best friend because the more routinized this becomes, the easier it becomes. Um, you're also not having to remember for every single project like a different, uh, completely different way you decided to store your files. So I'm going to be going through the OSF later, but this is just an example of kind of a standard uh, way that one lab um, run by Captain Corker has decided to kind of organize how they share files related to their projects. Um, so this is an OSF project that she uses as a lab template. Um, so every research project that comes out of that lab that is publicly shared kind of has this same basic structure. Um, so you kind of always know where the data files are going to be. You always know where the analysis scripts are going to be. Um, so I know this talk is mainly about sharing, but I do want to say that in order to share, you have to document. Um, and what a lot of times people will do is they'll start documenting at the point when they think about sharing. Um, so, oh, uh, I'm submitting to a journal that requires me to share my data with my peer reviewers. I should put my data in a place that peer reviewers can see it. Um, that's one way to do it. I would like to argue that actually the point where you want to start documenting is way back when you start designing your study. Uh, just because the research process can be very, very long, and by the time you get to writing a report, like you may have generated a ton of files and not really remembered where many of them are, and then you kind of version control problems, and it just, the longer you wait, the harder it is to get all these files together, put them in a place, organize them, document them. Um, and so really, you want to start the documentation process early, regardless of whether you actually know that you're going to share any of these files later on. Um, because documentation is a precursor to sharing. And even if you never share any of your files, having them documented for yourself is actually really important. Um, so you mm -hmm. want to start early, updating as you go. Um, 
And as I mentioned, documentation is helpful regardless of sharing intentions because the most likely person to try and reproduce your work is probably your future self. Um, there's this great quote, and I can't remember who it's from, um, but it's your past self doesn't answer emails. Um, you cannot email your past self and be like, hey, where's the data underlying this project? Um, I can say that in my own work and in you know a lot of the work I've done with other people, um, we are often building off of something that either we did previously or happened previously in that lab. And so there's this going back to, okay, where are the files related to that project? Oh, that grad student um, is no longer in the lab. Can we contact them? Um, and so it becomes this kind of investigation to try and figure out where these files are, even though they were files that we created ourselves. Um, and so having good documentation can help other people when you go to share it, but really one of the primary beneficiaries is going to be future you um, or other members of your lab. So now that we've kind of got the idea of documentation out of the way, we want to start thinking about what you might want to share. And every project is a little bit different, but I would say here are some things you should totally consider sharing. Um, some form of data, and I'll get into why uh, I haven't listed the form of data in a second. Um, another good thing to share is scripts. This can be analysis scripts, data cleaning scripts as well, um, scripts that show how figures are created. So any sort of documentation of an analysis process. Um, as I mentioned, materials um, and methods are really can be very important to share um, so that it can help others or future you um, kind of run a re run a replication of that work or run a replication and extension of that work. Um, so materials might include a detailed protocol of how the study was done. Um, it might include survey instruments if that's the type of work you do. It might include stimuli. So if you showed images to participants, um, those might those are probably good to save, um, maybe share. Um, this might also include if you do kind of biological research, um, information about reagent numbers, where you sourced um, certain uh, information from, information about cell lines, really anything about how you conducted that study, how you generated that data. Um, and then if you did a pre-registration, you'll want to share the pre-registrations. So, there's a category that I would put in maybe share, um, and this is just something you have to think through a little bit more. Um, so if you're sharing data, the ideal case that people usually talk about is sharing the raw data. Um, so the just the things you want to think about when you're thinking about sharing raw data is just making sure that the raw data isn't identifiable in any way, so it's ethically and legally okay to share that raw data. Sometimes that's not the case. Um, sometimes the raw data may be highly, highly identifiable, so you wouldn't want to share the raw data, at which point you might share process data or cleaned data or de-identified data. Um, I actually personally typically share both raw and clean data. Um, most of my data is not highly identifiable, um, and the cleaning process doesn't actually take that long. So I don't necessarily have to share clean data if I have raw data and I have a data cleaning script, somebody can just generate that clean data for themselves. Um, but I tend to share the clean data as well, just so that if somebody doesn't want to go through that process, they can just pull the clean data. Um, but if your data cleaning is something that takes like multiple hours, um, you know, maybe you're going from raw um, fMRI or EEG data to some sort of clean data that may take a really long time to run, then it might be more important for you to think about also sharing that cleaned data as well as the script that allows people to get from raw to clean. Um, also think about sharing postprints or preprints. So the reason this is a maybe and not definitive yes um, is because you do want to look at the policies of the journal um, that you either have submitted to or are thinking about submitting to. There's a great website called Sherpa Romeo. Um, that you can check the journal policies around postprints post and preprints on. Um, but that is definitely something you may want to think through about, do I want to share that? Um, you just have to check the policies. Most journals are pretty good about it nowadays, but there are some exceptions. And then there's a set of things that please, oh God, please do not share. Um, obviously confidential data, highly identifiable data, like patient data. Uh, please do not share that. Um, also, you don't want to share things that are 
under pre-existing restrictive licenses. Um, you know, if you used a scale in a SEBI that is copyrighted, you cannot just share that um, yourself. So you do want to be careful um, knowing what is legally allowed to be shared. Um, also, passwords, private keys. Um, when you're sharing analysis scripts, especially, you want to go through and look and just make sure that you don't have any passwords or keys uh, in your code that you're going to be accidentally sharing with everyone else. All right, so I'm going to kind of do a quick overview of OSF um, just to give you a rundown of kind of like how you could do some of these behaviors on the OSF. Uh, OSF is built by COS. It's free, it's open source. Um, OSF is not in any way the only way you can do this. There are a bunch of great platforms out there to do this. I just have to show it on one, so I'm going to show it on OSF. All right, let me just uh, switch my screen really quickly. Um, do, do, do. So, all right, so everybody should be seeing my OSF account. Um, so it's completely free to create an OSF account. Anyone can do it. You don't have to be at a particular institution or have a particular email domain or anything like that. Um, so if you just go to osf.io, you can sign up for an account. Um, some things to know, we, the default storage location for OSF is in the US. Um, if you need it to be somewhere else, um, once you create an account, you can go into your uh, profile settings. And then if you go to account settings, you can change your default storage location. Right now we have storage options in Australia, Canada, and Germany. Um, that will affect projects going forward. It won't retroactively change something. So if you are someone who's going to need to store your data in Europe, for example, I would suggest uh, doing that right when you make an account. Um, so if we go back to OSF and I look and I want to start a new research project. If I click create new project, um, it'll allow me to give it a title. Um, if I you know, want to change the storage location, I can do it here as well. Um, and then click create. And then that's going to take me to that new project. So every project on the OSF starts out basically the same. It has a very kind of open structure that you can do with it what you want. So I have my title, I have a list of contributors, which is right now is just me. Um, I can add a description of the project. Um, so let's say this is a experiment about whether uh, raccoons are creepy or not. I personally think raccoons are very creepy. Um, so I can also think about adding a license. Um, right now, because the project is private and all OSF projects start out as private, I can change that later. Um, because it's private right now, the license doesn't necessarily matter all that much, but before I switch the project to public, I will want to think about adding a license so that people know um, how they're allowed to reuse my work. So there are a couple different sections of this project. There's the wiki, and the wiki is a free text editor, um, which allows me to give some kind of overall description of the project if I want. Um, I can use it as a table of contents for the project if it gets really big. Um, I've also seen people put kind of like announcements in the wiki if there's something um, that they want everyone to know or read me. Um, there's then this section for files. There's a citation that's automatically generated for the project. So when I do make it public, people know how to cite um, and give credit for the work. And then there's this section called components. And this is how I can add more structure to my project. Um, so as I mentioned, having kind of a common project structure can be a really good thing just because it can make it predictable um, how projects from your past are going to look. Um, and so I have a typical structure that I tend to use for my projects. 
um, with like slight variations across projects. Um, so oftentimes when I first create a project, the first thing I'll do is I'll go in and I'll add three basic components. I will usually have a component for data. And I'll show you what these look like in a second. Um, I'll usually have a component for um, materials, depending on the field you're in. Um, I'm a psychologist by training, so materials is what we usually call that, but you might call it methods, protocols, whatever you want. Um, and then I also usually create a, another component for code. All right, so I now have one project with three separate areas in it. Um, and I can also think about starting to add people who I might want to collaborate on with this project. So if I go to contributors, this is how I'm going to give other people access to this project. Um, so if I click add, um, I'm going to add one of uh, my coworkers, Tim Arrington. Um, I can decide whether he's bibliographic or not. Um, so should he get credit for this work? I can also decide what level of permissions I want to give him. Um, so administrator has the highest level of permissions. That person can upload, download files. They can delete things. They can make public private decisions, make registrations. Um, read write is the default. This person will be able to upload and download files and create components and edit content, but they won't be able to make those public private or registrations decisions. And then there's read. Um, that person can see into the project. They can download files, but they can't make any changes. Um, so I'm going to add Tim as read write. Um, and I'm also going to add my boss, Brian Nosek. Um, but I'm only going to add him as read. So you can give different people very fine grain control over what they can do. And then it also says what portions of this project do you want to add them to? So I'm going to add them to just materials and code. Um, I could add them to everything, um, but let's say for this project, I'm going to have Tim do some blinded data analysis. Um, so I don't want him to be able to see the raw data right now. Um, because I'm going to provide him with a file that has the conditions uh, screwed up. And so he'll do the analysis on that. And then later on, I'll unwind him to the data. So if I click add, they will then get email notifications saying this is the project you've been added on. And then the, they'll have access to that project. The whole thing, though, is still private. So nobody else can see the project but myself, Tim, and Brian. So going back to those components I created, there are different people have kind of different ways of setting up OSF projects. So I tend to like using components. Um, and the reason is that they provide me a little bit more structure. Um, so I can add different contributors to different components. Um, if I go into the materials component, for example, You'll notice this looks just like a project. It's just one level nested. So what that means is that I can give it a different license. I can give it a different description. I could nest additional components under here if I wanted to. It also means that I can make it public or private separate from the rest of the project. Um, so components allow you to have kind of more fine grained control over who gets access to what, when, what is shared, what licenses things are under. Um, they also can all have their own DOIs, so that pe that means that people can cite your data or your code or your materials. Um, another way that some people organize their projects is using folders, and I actually use a combination of both. So if I click on materials, for example, if I click on OSF storage, I can create a folder, um, and I could say IRB materials, and that's just a, a folder. It doesn't, um, it doesn't get a DOI. It doesn't get a permanent link. So these links up at the top are called GUIDs. Those are permanent links. So those are always going to point back to that particular project. Um, even if I change the name of this project, that link will still come back to it. 
um, folders don't have that same permanency. Um, they're really just a visual way to organize files. Um, so if maybe you had a materials component and you had hundreds and hundreds of stimuli, you might put all those stimuli in one folder and then maybe have, you know, a survey instrument just hanging out in that component um, so that when people went into materials, they didn't see like 200 files. Um, but this is something that I would say play around a little bit with until you find a structure that you kind of like. And the structure that works for me may be very different from the structure that works for you. Um, and then what I can do is just upload files. Um, so if I click on OSF storage, you'll see this upload button. Um, you just want to click on the OSF storage for the component you want to put files into. Um, so here they're going to go into data. If I click upload, then I can upload anything on my computer. Um, this is not actually data, but I'm just going to upload a PDF. Um, Another thing you can do, um, so this is connected to OSF storage specifically, um, but maybe you don't want to put everything in OSF storage. So for example, all of my code, I tend to keep on GitHub. So rather than having it on GitHub and also uploading it to OSF storage, um, I could do that, but then there's a chance that the, the versions of those files would get disconnected from each other. And then even though I would have good version control on OSF and GitHub, if they were out of sync with each other, then all of a sudden I don't know which one is the canonical version and that just gets really confusing. So if I go into code, I can click on this add-ons button. And that will show me a list of providers that I can connect to an OSF project, one of which is GitHub. Um, so some of these are, you know, things like GitHub, GitLab. Others are kind of general repositories. Um, there's Figshare, there's Dataverse, um, Box, Bitbox, or Amazon S3, um, OneDrive. So if I enable GitHub, what it's going to do is it's going to tell me a little bit how this works. Um, it's slightly different for each add-on. If I click Confirm, it's going to, if I'd never done this before, it would take me to GitHub, have me log in. I've already done this, so I just need to import my profile. And then it's going to show me a list of, in this case, all the repos um, that I have read write access to. If this were Dropbox, it would show me a list of my Dropbox folders. Um, and so I am just going to connect a random one. And so what is going to happen is now when I go back to my project, the contents of that GitHub folder will show up inside my OSF project. So what this allows me to do is have some content stored on OSF, some content stored on other providers, but then link it all up in OSF. So if I want to tell somebody, hey, here's where you can get my code, my uh, materials and the data related to this project, I just have to send them to this one project link and then they can get to everything else. So it's a way to kind of have a centralized distribution hub for everything, but still get to use the specific services that you like for different parts of your workflow. And then if and when I decide to make this public, if I click the make public button, it's going to warn me, hey, you know, have you checked that there isn't any sensitive information in here? Um, and then it's going to ask me what parts of this do I want to make public. Um, and so this is one of the nice things about components. As I said, you kind of have fine grained control over what to make public and what not to make public. So maybe in materials, there's a bunch of copyrighted information. Um, so maybe I only want to make the data and the code public. Um, so what that means is that I will still be able to see what's in materials as well. Uh, Tim and Brian, but there's this little lock on there that shows that it's private. Um, and so that means that nobody else can see it. Um, so if I look at the same thing in an incognito window, so it doesn't know I'm logged in. Then you can see that it looks like the materials component isn't there. I can't uh, see it. Um, and, but I can see everything else related to the project. 
The other thing to note is let's say that I can't share those materials publicly, but the journal I am submitting to requires that I give reviewers access to those materials. Um, what I can actually do, I'll just make this private again. Um, you don't have to do this. It's just going to be slightly easier to show on um, the next thing. So let's pretend I hadn't made anything public yet, but I wanted to give reviewers access to the project. If you click on, you can either do it through settings or this little triple dot, create view only links. So if I click on that, what that will allow me to do is add a link. I can give it some sort of name just so I know what it's for. And then I have the option to anonymize it. So what this is going to do is it's going to strip out the contributor names from anything that the OSF has control of. So it won't list uh, the contributor names in the project. However, if you named one of your files like uh, Courtney's awesome materials, we can't change the name of your file. So like just make sure that your name isn't in the files or in the file names. Um, I'll anonymize it and then I can say what portions of the project do I want that link to give access to. I could either choose everything or I could unselect something. So let's say the raw data is highly, highly identifiable. And so like I cannot legally share that at any point in the process. I could just have the link give access to the code and the materials in the top level of the project. So once that link is created at that point, anyone who has the link can access the project, but um, it's not fully public. So if I go back to an incognito window, I'll show you what this looks like. So at this point, right, it's an anonymized link. So these are anonymous contributors um, in case the journal that you are submitting to does um, double blind peer review. Uh, it also doesn't say who's GitHub. It is. Um, this is a public GitHub, so like somebody could easily figure out that it's mine, um, but it won't show up on OSF. And as you can see, the link only gives access to materials or code, um, not to that data component. Um, I should mention that components are nestable. Um, so when if you have like data and then inside that another component that says raw data, um, you could give access to the top level of data, but not that sub nested component. Um, and then at any point you can break that link. So let's say the reviews came back and they're like, no, we don't like your uh, we don't like your your paper. We don't want to publish it. You could uh, remove the link and that would make the anonymous link no longer work. And then the last piece is when you make something public. Um, you have the option to create DOIs. Um, so once I've made this public, you'll see a create DOI button. So if I click on that, I'm not going to um, just because uh, I think DOIs are 25 cents or something, um, not to the user, but to COS. Um, but if I clicked on that, it would create a DOI for the project. Um, and then if I wanted separate DOIs for my data, my material, and my code, I could go into them now that they're all public and create DOIs um, for each of them. And then I could also add a license, which is a good thing to do so that people know how to reuse the project. So to kind of give you an idea of what one of these looks like once it has all the stuff in it, um, this is a project that was created for um, a paper that um, I just published in RSOS. Um, so you'll see that this is actually a pretty similar structure to the one I was just showing, right? I have my materials, my data, and my code. Um, this one, because of the project, um, I had done a couple presentations and I wanted to keep the presentation slides with the rest of the project. So I created another presentation component and then there were a bunch of supplemental files for the presentation that, you know, they weren't just code. They were code that had been run, so they were results, um, but they weren't directly in the manuscript. Um, so I just created another uh, component for them. But, you know, this is a real project of mine. This is the structure that I tend to use. Um, you'll see that I have my GitHub connected in here. 
Um, and here's kind of an example of how I will often use folders, um, right? There's a bunch of different files related to my IRB. By putting them in an IRB folder, it just seemed a little bit easier to navigate. Um, so I also wanted to give an example, because I'm going to talk about this in a minute, of how you can use the OSF if you can't share everything, but you do want to keep some things together so it's documented for you. Um, so I mentioned, you know, maybe the raw data is identifiable and you can't share that. Um, but I always want to know that that raw data goes with that project. So I don't want to just like have it hanging out on a random hard drive that I'm going to lose or something like that. Um, so this is uh, a project from the reproducibility project in psychology um, that I worked on ooh, six years ago now. That was a long time ago. Um, and this used data that was actually collected um, a couple years ago by another lab. Um, it was data on children and the IRB um, that they had used because it was collected you know, many years ago didn't allow for public sharing of the data. So we couldn't just put it in the OSF and make it public. Um, so if we go into the data component, and because I'm signed in, that's why you can see all of this. Um, this top level data component is public. But if you'll notice, all that's in it is some R files and a plot. There's this other component called replication data set, which is private. So this is the replication data set component is the component that actually holds that data file. Um, here it is, you can see it because I'm signed in. Um, it's in the Dropbox of the researcher who owns the data. And then in the wiki, what we've done is we've given instructions for anybody who wants to access that data, telling them what they need to do to access the data, um, because this part of the project is public. So basically it's just saying, hey, here's why we can't post the data. Um, if you wanna get access to the data, email, Sam Gosling and ask for a Buley link to this uh, component. So this is kind of a middle ground where we have the data with the project for our own documentation, um, but we can't publicly share it, but we wanna be transparent with people that yeah, there is a way to get the data. So we put that in a public part of the project. All right, um, so before I open it up to questions, I did just wanna go through um, a few other things, which is when to publicly share the information that you do plan to publicly share. Um, there are a lot of different points in time that you could do it. Some people do it like at the file's inception. Um, I know some people who the minute they have a data file, they put it online and they share it, or the minute they have their materials, those are online and they share it. Um, because I do most of my coding through GitHub, um, most of my GitHub repos are public. so. Every uh, file that's on GitHub is actually being shared the minute I push to GitHub. Um, other people sometimes share the first time they get a big conference presentation um, about the work. Um, some people share at the preprint stage if they post a preprint. Others will share at the peer review stage. Some journals now require you share at least with the reviewers. Um, you don't necessarily have to publicly share the information. Um, some people share when the manuscript is accepted. Some people share when it's actually been published. Um, any of those times are fine. There's not like I don't I don't personally have strong feelings that one of these is inherently better than the other. So I would say when you're thinking about sharing, um, don't get hung up on when you share. Um, I would say, you know, if you aren't typically sharing these things now and you want to start sharing, but like you're really only comfortable doing it at the publication stage, that is totally fine. Um, don't feel like you need to go like way back in this process. Um, the only one that I would say maybe think through that a little bit more is never with the caveat that there are situations where never really is the only thing you can do. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but any of these green options, totally fine. So when you are actually going to share, there are a couple things you want to check to make sure that those materials, that data, that code are as kind of reusable and accessible as possible. Um, the first is obviously to make sure there is no sort of protected information in any of the materials you're going to share. Um, so no identifiable information, uh, no copyrighted information, um, no passwords, anything like that. 
is your documentation in order? And what this means differs depending on what you're sharing. So for data sets, you want some sort of guide to the data, a code book, a data dictionary, so that people know what your data is and what it means so that um, they know what all the variables are, but also what the codes within those variables mean. So, you know, if I see somebody has gender and then one and two, what does one mean? What does two mean? Um, what does variable underscore 36 refer to? Um, this again is one of those things that'll help other people. It will also help future you because you probably will not remember what variable underscore 36 means three years from now. Um, for code, um, usually you want to have good documentation within your code. So commenting in the code, what you're doing and why, information about dependencies. Um, so if you're working in R, you know, what libraries, um, what versions of libraries, things like that. Um, make sure you give files um, some informative names um, so that people can tell kind of how to use those files. Um, you may also want a README that just kind of walks somebody through what you're sharing. So what are these files? How should they use them? Things like that. If you're not sure whether your information is documented enough, find a friend. Um, you know, this could be somebody else in your lab. This could be, um, you know, a friend in the field. The it's really sometimes hard to decide whether something has enough detail yourself. And so getting kind of an independent pair of eyes on it can be very good for this. Um, another thing to do before you share is to choose a license for it, to tell people how they're allowed to reuse the data. Um, licensing is its own like big topic. I'm not gonna go into it today, um, but uh, Creative Commons has some great information about licensing. Um, that can be helpful in kind of choosing a license. Um, and after you've made something public, um, if you're using a service that allows you to mint DOIs, if you're using OSF, for example, um, mint DOIs so that uh, people can, uh, it, it's not a requirement to cite to have a DOI, um, but a lot of publishers kind of expect a DOI and a citation. Um, so mint those DOIs so that you can have them as part of the citation. Right, and so as I mentioned, um, everything on OSF has these GUIDs, which are permanent identifiers, so files, projects, components. Um, and so when you, if you've shared information, you wanna kind of let people know that you've shared it. Um, and so if you're sharing as part of a published work, um, what I've seen some people do, and I actually really like this, um, I believe this is a table from a paper by E.J. Wagamacher. Um, he just had a table that shows, hey, here are all the things that I'm sharing. Um, here's what they are, and then here's the URL to where you can find them on the OSF. Um, so it's just a, a way to kind of organize that information within the paper um, to kind of help people navigate to it more easily, because if you share things, you want people to be able to find it. All right, so I did say that I was going to talk about what happens if you can't share information, um, and there are a number of reasons why you may not be able to share. Um, data may have ethical restrictions on it. Um, there's a lot of data out there that should not be shared. It's highly identifiable, it's highly sensitive. Um, there also may be things under restrictive licenses. Um, you know, if somebody shared something um, in one type of license, it may restrict what you can do with it or how you can share it later on. Um, especially if you are going back to work that was done with older um, IRB consent or protocols, there may be information in that IRB that restricts whether you can share um, the data um, or for how long you can share it or something like that. Um, a lot of old, old IRB protocols would say something like the data will be destroyed after X years. Um, and so if you're gonna put it on a platform and share it till the end of time, like that's the problem. Um, you can sometimes go back to your IRB and they'll you know, allow you to make a modification to that, but not always. Um, and especially for materials, um, some of those may be copyrighted. Um, there are a lot of um, images or stimuli or things like that that may be under copyright, and at that point, you cannot publicly share them. So think about sharing as a continuum. Um, so I'm going to give an example of this with data. Um, so let's say your data has some highly identifiable information in it. So you cannot ethically share the raw data. Um, 
So think about other things you could do to try and share as much as you can about the process. Um, so even just sharing the materials around the data, so protocols, surveys, analysis scripts, that tells somebody a lot about how that data was generated, how it was analyzed. Um, they may not have the data itself, but that actually gives them a lot of useful information and it gives future you a lot of useful information. Another step would be to share the full codebook or data dictionary so that it's transparent what is in that data file, just not exactly the data. And then the aggregate descriptive statistics. Um, you can actually do a lot with aggregate statistics. So if, for example, I'm running a structural equation model, all I need from a data set is the correlation matrix, and I can reproduce most SEM, as long as I have the code, um, most structural equation models. Um, so aggregate information usually gets around um, identification problems, but can be really powerful. You might also share a subset of the data that isn't sensitive. So maybe if there's only like two columns in the data that are sensitive, um, maybe you keep a well-documented private version of that raw data, but then share out a de-identified cleaned data set that doesn't have those columns in there and then give people information about how they might get access if there's any way they could get access to that raw data. Um, and then another way would be to allow people to access the entire data set if they go through appropriate data sharing agreements. Um, so some data has to be set up in like a data enclave or you have to sign some sort of um, waiver or get their IRB to contact your IRB or something like that. Um, and so in that case, what you'd wanna do is have the data well documented on your end privately and then just make it clear and transparent the steps that somebody would need to go through to get access to that data. So share the process they would need to access the data, and then it's up to them to go through those steps. Um, similarly, if you had, let's say, materials that you couldn't share because they were copyrighted or something, you would still want to keep a copy of those materials so you always know how the study was run. Um, you couldn't share them, but you could in the, if you were sharing other materials related to the study, you could say, you know, at this point, um, participants were shown the XYZ scale. Um, we can't reproduce the scale here because it's owned um, by the copyright of ETS, but here's how you get access to that scale if you want it um, by like contacting ETS and asking for this thing. So there are a lot of ways to be transparent and share as much as you legally and ethically can, um, even in situations where you may say, oh, I can't share the full thing, and that's totally fine. Just think through, well, are there parts that I could share still? Um, so if you wanna, as I mentioned, like setting up OSF projects, you can set them up a ton of different ways. Um, there are some example links if you wanna look at kind of what different project structures look like. Um, and, you know, as I said, this is something where, depending on the type of research you do, some project structures may make more sense than others. And that's something that you might play around with for a little bit, you know, try a structure for a project, see if it works, and then make changes when you do the next one. And then after a little bit of time, you'll tend to fall into something that you're like, oh, okay, this basic structure works pretty well for most projects that I do. And then maybe I have to make some slight changes um, or something like that. But it is pretty flexible, which is nice, but can also be a little intimidating at the start. Um, but you can always change things. So yeah. All right. Um, so I've talked to you all for a very long time. So I wanted to go ahead and open it up to questions if there were any. Right. Hi, thank, thank you, Lord Rodney. Um, that was really, really good. Um, we actually have quite a lot of questions, so I'd like to um, I'd like to encourage people to upvote the ones that they um, want answered most, uh, because I think it's going to be quite difficult to to decide which ones to go for. So um, I'm going to go ahead and read the first one that has um, the highest number of votes so far. It's quite a long one, so bear with me. Do let me know if you want me to to repeat anything. 
So uh, Heather Capes said, thanks for the talk. At one point, I read a piece about making sure to save your receipts to show that a study had actually been done and any other important elements of it that are otherwise hard to document. I started adding PDFs of email exchanges I had with my RAs where I gave them instructions for how to conduct the study, etc. Mm -hmm. These are helpful because of the procedural details as well as because those people could testify theoretically that we actually did the study if needed. But I wonder whether this is actually a good thing to have on a public OSF uh, project page. What is your take? Oh, OK, so I. I've never heard this before. I assume that where this is coming from is if somebody accused you of saying you fabricated the whole study that you would be able to say like, no, 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 I actually ran it. Um, so. I've never heard of any like except like a couple of really strong fraud cases. I've not heard of like in general people accusing people of not actually running the studies that they did. Um, but what I would say is if you want to do that sort of documentation, I would put it in a private component of that project on the OSF. Um, so that if you ever needed to show that documentation, you knew where it was, but not something that you publicly shared with everybody. Um, I would also probably uh, get different. I think different countries have different rules about like whether email, like whether emails are considered like certain types of communication, like if it would be okay to share that and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I would just like think through that, but. As a default, I would put that in a private component of an OSF project and not publicly share it. Um, yeah, I like I tend to a lot of my work is done in. Now a lot of my work is done in Qualtrics, so like I tend to output the Qualtrics survey file and then the timestamped Qualtrics data. Um, but if you are working with something that doesn't have like such an obvious file type or file stamp, um, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a, it's a really good idea with Qualtrics because I've worked with that as well, but I never thought of uh, just uploading that directly because it has a timestamp. Yeah, cool. um, it's a really good find. OK, so the next question that's been um, upvoted quite highly by Anonymous. Um, this is a great overview of OSF. Thank you. Um, if you link to GitHub, is it possible to take a snapshot of your code? Example that you use for a paper, but continue to update the GitHub repo. Yeah, um, and so actually you can do that through the registration function in OSF. Let me just uh, share my screen really quickly. Um, so if you go into your OSF project, um, there is, let me go back to this. Um, so there's this registrations tab, and usually this is gonna be used for doing a pre-registration. Um, but registration just means that it's taking a snapshot of the project as it currently exists and creating a copy that is never going to change. The project can keep changing. That registration copy is never going to change. And so you can actually use registrations to kind of create copies of a project at important points in its life. So some people actually register at the end of a project to be like, this is what it looked like at the point where I publish it. So what's going to happen when you register a project is it's going to, to make a copy of everything that is currently in the project, copy it over to the registration, and then that will have its own GUID, its own links. That will never change. The project can keep going. So if I had like all this information in my GitHub repo, OSF would go to GitHub, make a copy of what it currently looked like, and put that in the registration. So um, that is a way that you could do that with GitHub. And then as you made changes, the new changes would show up in this OSF project, but that registration would stay the same. Um, I'm not going to do that on this project just because it does take a little while to make all those copies, especially if you have a lot of files. Um, but I would encourage you to look into that registration functionality as a way to kind of create those static versions of a project um, at important points in time. OK, brilliant. Thank you so much. And thanks for the, the short demo as well. That was really helpful. Uh, so then we have a question from uh, Sam 
a friend of raccoons everywhere, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> who said, um, I wonder if you could talk a little more about the different licenses you can select for an OSF pre-registration. There's so many to choose from, and I'm not sure which one is best for me or whether there's a safe default to use. Ah, OK. Um, so I'll talk about licenses in general, because I believe the licenses that are for pre-registration are the same licenses that are available everywhere. Um, and talking about it in general won't force me to create a registration to show you this. Uh, so if I click on the licenses tab, um, there are a couple of different licenses that are available, and that's because different groups have different suggested licenses. The license that I typically suggest for people is either CC0 or CC BY. Um, so CC0 basically means you are, it's it's putting a license on it that basically says people can do anything they want with it. Um, they are not required by the license to do anything. They don't have to give you credit. Um, they probably will just because like in academia, that's typically what we do, but it's not required by the license. Um, they can reuse it however they want. They can change it however they want. Um, CC BY is still pretty open. It just means that attribution has to be given um, according to the license. So if I make my code or my pre-registration CC BY, that just means that anybody who um, is reusing that information needs to cite me, needs to give me proper attribution. So I tend to suggest that people give their pre-registrations um, CC BY licenses. Um, the time when CC0 over CC BY makes a lot of sense is for data. Um, data, at least in the US, also I am not a lawyer, uh, data in the US is not copyrightable because it is a fact. Data structures are copyrightable, the data itself is not. Um, and so giving data a CC0 license just makes it like really obvious to everybody that you are saying, yeah, you can do whatever you want with this because I know this isn't copyrightable. Um, because like what's a data structure versus data can get like complicated. Um, I specify in the US because I do not know how it works in other countries. Um, but in general, the more, the less restrictive your license is, that means the more reusable it is by other people. Um, and some licenses that seem like they're doing what you want aren't actually. So like CC BY, um, NC, which is CC by non-commercial, um, can actually get complicated because you think what you're doing is just saying that like nobody can sell my stuff. Um, but in some countries, um, like anything that makes money is considered commercial. So like, um, let's say that I am a science blogger and I have some ads on the side of my website to help me pay for hosting the site. I couldn't necessarily um, reuse your material to write a blog about it on my blog, even if I gave you attribution because I'm running ads on that. It might be harder for an institution to reuse it, an educational institution. So like licensing can get really complicated. In general, you want to try and make the license as open as possible if you're trying to allow people to reuse it. Um, but for pre-registration specifically, I suggest CC BY or CC0. Lovely, um, thank you. That was a really comprehensive uh, answer. So I think we have our time. Long answer. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. D did you want to add anything else? Oh, no. Uh, just Sam, um, raccoons are creepy. <laughs> creepy little people plants. I agree with you on that. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, so we have one question from Anonymous again uh, asking, uh, some argue that the OSF makes university hosted data storage platforms obsolete. Do you agree with this or is there value in having universities storing data? I ask because OSF is cheaper, efficient and more user friendly. Ah, so um, there definitely is a place for university storage. Um, and so actually OSF, maybe like two weeks ago, November 3rd, because um, there was nothing else going on on November 3rd anywhere in the world, um, implemented storage caps. So to go into this a little bit more, um, it used to be that OSF had totally unlimited free storage. Um, 
and we had that for a long time. And what we found was that most people were being kind of very good about that. Um, but there were a couple projects that were putting like 50 terabytes of data on the site. So like our storage costs were going up exponentially. They're mostly driven by a couple of uh, a couple of projects. And so we decided to implement storage caps. And so what that means is for any node on the OSF, and a node is a project or a component, if it's public, you can have up to 50 gigabytes of storage on OSF in that public node. So every single component you have could have 50 gigabytes of public storage. If it's private, a component could have up to five gigabytes of storage on OSF storage. And so if you are somebody who does maybe fMRI data or genetics data where you're generating terabytes or petabytes of data, um, storing it on the OSF actually isn't really the place to store it. Um, and so what we are trying to move towards is kind of a hybrid model where we connect to more university storage um, centers so allow people to keep those really, really large data files in their university supported storage, but then connect that to OSF or you know, keep it in Amazon S3 or OneDrive or something like that that's built for those massive, massive um, amounts of storage. Connect that to the OSF so that they can keep their you know, petabytes of data on their university storage, their um, code in GitHub, and then maybe their materials on OSF and connect it up in one place. Um, so we still very much see a place for um, university storage, and we're looking in the future to connect more of that university storage to OSF. Lovely, thank you. So I think we're just about um, running out of time. Um, maybe let's just end with one one last question because uh, I'm actually curious about this as well. So uh, someone asked um, one downside of using components seems to me to be that you can't keep the file project structure that you use on your own computer. So someone couldn't just download everything and run the scripts with the file structure provided. Is that right? Um, it slightly depends on how you set up your components. Um, so, for example, if you had data and code together and you had your R script set up so that um, the script and the data had to be in the same folder, then like if somebody downloaded the components individually, the data and the code would be in two different places. Um, so that would be true. Um, what I personally tend to do um, is in my R scripts, there's an R package for OSF called OSF R. Um, and so because I like components, but I also want to get around this problem of uh, my data and my code being in two different components. So um, some of the dependencies break if people download them separately. In my R code, I actually have calls to the OSF component where my data is stored. So the R script, if somebody just downloads my analysis component and then runs that script, the first thing the component or the script is going to do is go to the OSF files that they need, download them, and then they'll be downloaded into whatever working directory that person currently is in. Um, and so then they're all in the right place and the rest of the script will run. And so that kind of allows me to get the best of both worlds. Um, but yeah, that's one of those things where like there are upsides to components. There are also some slight downsides to the components. So like I really love components, but like Tim, uh, my coworker, my manager, he loves folders. And so you'll see us set up our OSF projects slightly differently. So that's one of those times where you might play around with options um, and see what works best for you. But I would also say if you're an R user, look into the OSF R package. Um, it can be really helpful for kind of efficiently putting together your code um, and your uh, data. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, and thank you for your time today. Uh, I think it's been really informative for everyone and um, we'll pop it on our YouTube page uh, next week. So people who haven't had a chance to to listen today or people who want to listen to it again uh, can do so. So just before um, everyone's heading off, I just wanted to 
Uh, give a brief reminder if you can complete the feedback form. Uh, I have put it in the live Q&A box so you can click on the form. Shouldn't take longer than a few minutes just to to give us some feedback on how we're doing and any future speakers that you'd like to to hear. Um, and also remember to come back next week uh, on Thursday. I think we have um, Dr. Jessica Flake on measurement measurement. Um, so right, thank you everyone for listening and thank you, Courtney. Yeah, and if there are any other questions, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer those. Lovely. So uh, what I can do is I can um, I can get a record from all the chats in the Q&A and send them to you and you can choose to answer those if you'd like to and send them back to us. Oh, that's fine. OK, lovely. Right. Thank you so much, everyone. Right. Thanks so much for having me.